Good morning, Hilltop Baptist Church. How's everyone doing today? It's a great day to, to be in the Lord's house and to, and to worship and to be with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And today we are blessed with the Spanish praise team with us today. We are going to hear a couple wonderful songs, uh, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High and Oh, Praise the Name. So let us stand while we worship the Lord in song. good? Amen. Amen. I cast my love to Calvary, where Jesus bled.
always lives. Amen. our blessings and our prayer requests. And does anybody have any prayer blessings or praise that they would like to share with us today? Isabel. So prayers for Isabel's work. Uh, Jerry? Amen. Amen. Yes, traveling mercies for the pastor. Okay. Yes? Okay. All right, for Wayne's sister with an operation. Okay. Any additional prayer requests, uh, physical needs, spiritual needs? Isabel. Continue prayers for Bob. Yes, uh, my wife. Wendy, did you say? Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, for all that you do in our lives. And every day, every week, we, Lord, we have answers to prayer and prayer blessings, and, and we thank you for that, Lord. And uh, many things on our list here, Lord, and, and uh, one that stands out to me is Virgil, Lord. You know, he had the knee operation, and uh, he's doing very well with his recovery, Lord. We thank you for that. Thank you for the new visitors that you bring to our church, Lord. Uh, the Bible studies, the good news going out, Lord, all, all the things that you're doing in all of our lives. And uh, on the other side, Lord, we, we have our spiritual requests for you, Lord, um, whether it's family or friends that, that desperately need you, Lord. They, they need seeds planted. Uh, we need lives saved, Lord. Uh, we pray for Liz's family, uh, Dustin Coyote, Peggy Nelson, the Biddlecombe family, Lord, the Hotzel family. All the names and families on here, Lord, that, that need you, we, we pray for them. We pray for our work needs, whether it's a, a better position in your current job, Lord, or a new job, uh, we pray for those. And our physical needs, Lord, we, we pray for, for Daryl Bolt in his neck, Lord, for, for Bob, Isabel's husband, Lord, we pray that, um, that you are the great physician, Lord, and, and that situation is in your hands, Lord, and we just, we pray for comfort um, and healing, Lord, for Bob and for him. And, and for his family members that are dealing with that as well, Lord. And all those on here with cancer and leukemia, Lord, we pray for them. Um, pray for Wendy, Lord, uh, with, she's waiting on cancer results. And um, everyone else on here, Lord, we, we pray that your will um, will be done, Lord. And lastly, we have our unspoken requests, Lord. We, we pray for all these unspoken requests, Lord. We, we find comfort in knowing that you know what our needs are before we do, Lord. You know what's on our hearts before we do. And even those that are not on this list, we, we pray for those, Lord. Uh, we just give you thanks and praise for this day that we can gather here and worship in a, in a free country, Lord. And, and we just ask that you'll be with us, um, that we will take today's message, Lord, and, and that it'll, it'll touch us and, and, uh, and do a good work, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Okay. Um, as many of you know, Pastor is not with us today. And Pastor Sean from Grossmont Hope, Hope Church, <laughs> Hope Church in Grossmont La Mesa area is here uh, to preach to us today. And uh, he'll tell us a little bit of, about himself. And uh, we look forward to his message today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let me get situated. How's everybody doing today? Awesome, awesome. Get ready. So like I said, my name is Sean Bodwin. Uh, I am the lead pastor of Hope Church San Diego, or just Hope Church. And we're kind of like the La Mesa area, and we're like one of those crazy locations where you go over here, you're in El Cajon, you go over here, you're in Spring Valley, you go over here, you're in Lemon Grove. And, and we're really close, just off the 125, 805 from here. And, and let me just say it's an honor and privilege. Pastor Walt is a mentor of mine, and he's poured, he's been there through me through, through many things, and when he gave me the call, I said, hey, man, can you come preach at, at Hilltop? I, I was just excited. I was like, yes, of course I will. Like, all right, my service is 9, 10, 15. I'll be over here. I'll make it. Yes. And I'm going down the freeway. So thank you guys for the honor and privilege of having me here today. I appreciate it. Pastor Walt kind of wanted me to tell a little bit of my testimony before I started, just to kind of introduction so you guys know who it is who we're having this conversation who's talking to you today so uh, my name is Sean Bodwin and before I was a pastor well before I had God in my life I made really bad decisions I grew up in bad uh, childhood and everything and I was a six-time felon I got eight years in county state and prison time uh, federal state uh, a group homes uh, rehabs everything and then one day five days after getting out of prison God rocked my world forever. And so I want to encourage you, if you've got somebody in your life that you know who's struggling, if you've got somebody in your life who you know who's been a little farther than God, you've been praying for them, don't stop praying. Because God changes hearts. And God transforms people. So later on, I got out. Five days later, uh, I became an intern pastor, which was crazy, right? Became a pastor, started my journey in a ministry. This was 2013. Then signed up for school, got a degree from Liberty, then got my master's from Gateway, and then ended up getting a doctorate. So now it's actually Dr. Sean Bowden. It's not even more crazy, right? But I'm not big on titles, so you can just call me Sean if you like. Pastor Sean does not matter to me. Um, and recently, my wife and I, we stepped out in faith. I left my associate pastor position at New Vision Church, where I was at for years. And we started a church called Hope Church. And that's our whole goal, was to bring hope. Hope is the gospel. Hope, hope, hope is salvation. Hope is having God and transformation in your life. And so that's what we want to bring. And today was our fourth Sunday. And let me tell you something. God is blessing our church. And I'm just like, me and my wife are like so grateful, so thankful. And like I live out here, it's, it's multi-ethnic. It, it's it's multi-generational. And it's multi socioeconomic and it's just awesome and, and matter of fact last week we had our first baptism sunday and 16 people got baptized i mean that is amazing that's something you can clap for and just seeing god work and we're just we're just okay god we're just gonna be faithful and so we want to be a church that plants churches and so we are going to be kind of on that uh road as a matter of fact one of my other mentors were looking at coming together we've been somebody we've been discipling for a while and he lives in, in moreno valley and we want to go plant a church out there in Moreno Valley. And it's not about a church kingdom. It's about the kingdom. And that's what it's about. Too many times we get territorial. But you know what? La Mesa needs the gospel. Chula Vista needs the gospel. Moreno Valley needs the gospel. Everywhere needs the gospel. So I just want to thank you guys for, for, for allowing me to be here. Um, I, I told my, my Hope Church family, I said, I got to go. All right, but Pastor Walt called. And when Pastor Walt calls... You got to answer. Amen. Amen. So at my church, we're going through a series called Building a Foundation. That's what we want for our church is to build a foundation. I believe every church, sometimes we got to revisit this because we got to remember that it has to have a foundation before you build the house. And sometimes you got to look back at the house, look back at the foundation. Okay, let's make some adjustments. And, and so the first sermon, we talked about God's plan. What was God's plan from our life? We're going through the book of Ephesians. The second one. We talked about knowing God, not just in our head, knowing that God exists, but actually trying to have a, a relationship and really get to know him. And then last week, we talked about the gift of grace. 
how salvation is not by something we could do, but it's a free gift that God gives us to those who believe. And today, we're going to talk about reconciliation. Everybody say reconciliation. Reconciliation is unifying or bringing something together that once was divided. And we can look around in our world, that division is real, amen? And, and, and if we're not careful, we can let the enemy creep in and try to sow seeds of division in our relationships, in our homes, or even in our churches. Ever since the beginning, there's been division. Ever since Adam and Eve in Genesis, when the first sin was, and, and, and Satan talked Adam and Eve into committing sin and separated because the vision, this thing that separated man from God, there's been that. But also, we're all different. There's division because a lot of us are different. We don't look the same. None of us look the same. Look around this room real fast. Nobody looks the same. We don't think the same. We might not have the same likes. We might have the same dislikes. But what stays the same, what keeps us grounded, what keeps us together is one thing, and his name is Jesus. And so we always got to remember the main thing has to say the main thing. Matter of fact, in context to, to families, in my, in my opinion, I think the biggest problem with the world today is Satan has gotten to the family structures, has divided families. You know the quickest way for him to do that is? One simple way. You don't need all these strategies. No, no. Go for the marriage. If Satan can attack them, if Satan can divide the marriage, the whole house gets split. If, if Satan can attack what marriage means, the whole concept is not the same. Same thing with our churches. When people start gossiping about each other instead of building each other up, start tearing each other down. Or churches having church kingdoms instead of the kingdom. But beautiful thing is Jesus is our reconciler that tears down the walls of division that unites us together. So number one, you know, so if you got your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. We're going to look at 11 through 12 today in the text. I'm an expository preacher, so I like to go through the text and kind of grow and see what the Bible has to say. So when you get to your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, uh, will you say amen? Amen. Amen. You guys are fast, okay? So number one in your notes, reconciliation conquers the dividing walls that keep us separated. Reconciliation conquers the dividing walls that keep us separated. Verse 11 says, so then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised, by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. Now, just to get on the same page where we know what we're talking about here, the circumcision was the Jews. The uncircumcised, well, that was this... Uh, uh, Ridicule or mockery way of saying that, that you are not one of the Jews, that, that you are not one of God's people, that you are one of the other people, and we are separated. And, and the Jews, those were God's chosen people. These are the people that God chose, said, you were going to be my chosen people, and he gave them certain diets, he gave them certain ways to live, and he said, I want you to be a light for the rest of the world. Now, Gentiles, in case you don't know what Gentiles means, Gentiles means other nations. Everybody say other nations. Or everybody else. So unless you're of Jewish descent, probably going to fall under the Gentiles. We're the other people that get to hear the gospel and get to be part of this family now. But for years, because there were so many differences between the two, the way they ate, the way they lived, the way they talked, the way they worshipped, there became this animosity between each other. And by nature, human nature, we don't like things that are different, do we? No. If something's different than, uh, I don't know, we like things the same. Some of us, we don't like change too well. We don't deal with it too great. And, and so when something's different or something's not the way we like it or somebody has a different way of doing things, we tend to be like, eh, I don't know. Sometimes we can put these divisions or walls and say, okay, that's, that's your way. 
You, you do that over there, and I'm going to be over here. Verse 12. At that time, you were without Christ. He's talking about us. Excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise with hope and without God in the world. You see, when, when you're not part of the family of God, you don't have the same rights. You're not part of the family. You, you, in these covenants that, that God would make for his family, for God would make with his people, were all through Scripture. And some of the biggest ones, if you remember, with Abraham, when God made the covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. God made another one with, with Moses when he led the people out of Egypt and said, I'm going to make another covenant, the Mosaic covenant. Or even King David, when he said, your kingdom will last forever. He made a covenant with his people. But then the New Testament, we have the ultimate covenant. We have the new covenant that Christ made. And that one applies for all of us. That is the one where we now get an option to be a part of God's family. We now get the option of being together and all the rights, all the things of inheritance. We get that opportunity as well. 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near, brought closer to Christ by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Let me let you know something. If, if you're sitting there looking for peace here this morning, there is no peace like the peace that comes from God. There is no peace like the peace who comes from Christ. You're trying to find peace in all these different ways, find, find joy in all these other ways, find happiness. Seek no further because God is our perfect peace. And it says, who made both groups, we're talking about the Gentiles and Jews, one. Everybody say one. one. And he tore down the dividing wall of hostility. That means the two are now one. We have one church and that is called the church, the church of God. And that's the chosen people. Remember I said Israel was the chosen people in, in the Old Testament. That's the ones who he, he, he gave a different diet to. He gave a different way of lifestyle to. And, and the, the, the circumcision was a physical uh, expression of that covenant that made it said they are my people. And the whole goal for that was he's like, oh, that's kind of messed up. I remember reading that when I first was reading the Bible. I was like, why? What about the Gentiles? How come they don't get a relationship? How come only the Jews get a relationship? But his whole point was, I'm going to make this people set apart for myself so they will be a light to the rest of the world. And everybody else will be like, man, I want that in my life, too. And now that we're the church, we are supposed to be the light. When people see our lives, they should be like, man, I want that too. And so we get this peace and peace is the opposite of hostility. It refers to the state of harmonious friendship with God and with one another in the church. And God himself did this for no other saw the problem division between God and man because we couldn't. And, and, and if we want to get real, real with you. Even with the division between our, ourselves, that has to be done by God, too. He is our reconciler. He is the one that heals the separation and the brokenness that is created by sin. Christ took the two hostile camps and he made them one people. Christ broke down the dividing walls that separate us. Matter of fact, and they each had physical walls, like, for example, um, in the temple that he's talking about. So there was this wall that was from the outer court where the Gentiles were allowed to go to. And it's a wall that separated the Gentiles to the inner court, which only the Jewish people could go to. And I didn't bring it today. I'm sorry, but they had this inscription on there. And the inscription basically said, if you are not a Jew, if you are a Gentile, and you cross this line, if you cross this dividing wall from the outside and you try to come inside, you will be killed. It was this wall that separated the two people. Sometimes we can put walls or barriers between us. Sometimes we can have those stand away and divide us. Huh? We've seen a lot. What are those barriers? Well, Sometimes those barriers could be 
generational in our age. Sometimes we have those barriers be cultural. There's cultural barriers sometimes. Sometimes some of those barriers could be race. Sometimes those barriers could be politics. Sometimes those barriers could even be your economic status. We can divide us. Oh, you're this people group over here. Have you ever, let's be honest, have you ever labeled somebody? Oh, you're, 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 oh yeah, you're, that, you're that people group. Well, guess what? God loves that people group too. And God died on the cross for that people group too. And that's why I love when I look in this room right now and I look at my church. I love it because you see everybody. You see, you see every different race. You see principals and teachers. You see police officers. You see people just getting out of prison. You see everybody. You see people that vote, vote red. You see people that vote blue. You see people who make $10,000 a year. You see people that make, well, we don't have anybody that makes $10 million, but you guys get what I'm saying. It's a little bit of everybody and we don't separate ourselves because you know what? That person is God's son or daughter. That person you have a, a disagreement with, that person that's different from you is God's son or daughter and he died on the cross for them too. And we have to remember that because if we separate that, if we say, oh, no, 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 God, they're one of them. You have just put a line between you and a child of God. That means you have put a line between you and God and don't even know it. And as Christians, we can't do that. We can't do it. Matter of fact, in 2020, I'm going to tell you something. You guys remember all the division in 2020, right? The church I was at was a little bit of everybody. And literally our church, half was on this side of every major issue from the politics to the, to the racial issues to the COVID issues. And half was on the other side and our church literally split in half. What I saw, it broke my heart because when I saw people who used to pray together, when I saw people who used to worship together, who used to serve together, who used to come and fellowship together, are now going back and forth on Facebook, talking bad about each other, unfriending each other, and now won't even speak to one another. That broke my heart. Our church literally split in half, not just figuratively, literally. And the enemy used that to divide our church. And we can't let that happen because Christ has to be in the center of our church. Christ has to be in the center of our lives. Guess what? Look around the room. Not everybody in this room thinks exactly like you. <sighs> Can you believe it? Not everybody thinks exactly like you. There might be one of those issues or any issue that I talked about where two people might have a different opinion. That is okay. As long as we keep Christ as the main thing and always keep the main thing, the main thing. That's what keeps us together. It's the cross that keeps us together. And then those walls become removed because we don't allow them to be in our lives. Because we have Jesus. And then the beautiful thing is, because we have Jesus, if we start focused on Jesus and not our differences, we start to get to appreciate the things that make us different. Our cultures. Our views. The way we do things. We start to look at people in a different light. We start looking at people you ever got a new pair of glasses and before you, you kind of and all of a sudden you start like, oh my goodness. I see things are totally different to me now. We put our Jesus goggles on and we start seeing people how he sees them and not how we do. 15. He made no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create for himself one new man, a new Adam, from the two resulting in peace. You see, the law was there and it was full of ordinances that served to separate God's chosen people. Remember I told you they had diet restrictions. They also had rules and things they had to live by. And the purpose for that was to separate them so that they could 
be a light to the world. So the world would see their light, see God's people and say, I want to be part of that. I need this God. Whatever's working in their life, I need that too. And what I like to call is contagious hope is what we have at our church where people start seeing people living in their lives and they see their family member who, who once, when we, our, our church is kind of crazy because we have a bunch of people that are n- new to Christianity or have just came to Christianity. In the last six weeks, we had literally 35 people come to Christ. That is awesome. And they're seeing it because they've seen a family member come and their family member's living it out. They want it. We're doing it. And, and, and God's just moving. Because as Christians, we got to be a light at our jobs. At our social settings, at the gas station, not just on Sunday, but every day, even when we think nobody's looking. But when Jesus came to earth and died on the cross, he fulfilled that law. And he said, it is finished. And when he took the whole law, he made into the new covenant or the new royal law, which was basically summed up in two things. Love God and love thy neighbor. Or keep it simple. Love God and love people. You got to have both. You can't say you love God if you don't love his people and his people a lot of times are different than you. I know when somebody saw my church, somebody came in and they came from a different style of church because, praise God, there's so many different styles of churches and God uses all of them. And she came and she said, our, our, we're, we're a little more rugged behind, you know, on the edges. And she said, God loves those people too. And he does. He loves you. He loves me. And he loves all of his children just the same. So we got to remember that whenever we put up these divisions between us. Because Jesus is the reconciler that tears down the walls of division and unites us all together. Number two, because of this reconciliation, we now have peace with God. Verse 16 through 18. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body. Everybody say one body. Through the cross by which he put hostility, he put division, he put separation to death. And this wasn't meant to be a gradual thing. No, this was more like when Christ died on the cross, it was a verdict and it's supposed to be pronounced and set immediately. There is no excuse for us to have division among each other as Christians. Matter of fact, the Bible even says, you know how they say that you would know that you are my children? Yeah, because of your love, not because of your hate, not because of your difference, because of your love. Because when we start to love like he loves, it's a different type of love that loves not because of your situation, not because of what you look like, not because of what you could do for me. It's I see through all that and I see God's love in you. And what he did by this is he brought fallen humanity out of alienation into a state of peace and harmony with God. You see, the goal was not just to reconcile these two groups together. That wasn't just it. His goal was to reconcile them to God. You see, there's a vertical relationship, which is up and down. And there's a a, a, a horizontal relationship, which is all around. You see, a vertical relationship is between us and God. The horizontal relationship is between us and people. And if you ever wonder why, why this is messed up between us and people, like maybe you got some tension in your marriage, things aren't going right, and it's kind of just uh, like that. Maybe you got tension in your family or at your workplace, and it's like, uh. before you fix this, let me tell you something. You first got to fix this. Because if you fix this, this will all come into place. I'm going to tell you something. When, when me and my wife, we never get in an argument ever. In the almost eight years we've been married, we've never gotten one argument. You're supposed to laugh at that one. <laughs> Anybody who's married, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes, you know, you're different, totally different people. And, and, and whenever we get in an argument, things just aren't right, right? But then I got to look at it. Why is it not right? 
Well, whenever it's not right with us and people, first we got to remember that something's not right with us and God. So first we got to get right. You know what, God? That's your daughter. My wife, Natalie, is your daughter. And I'm having some uh, against your daughter. I got to fit. Lord, please forgive me. Forgive me for, 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 for my sin. Help me look at my wife like you do. Use me to show your love through me right now. Same thing for the person at work who gets on your last nerve. Anybody ever had somebody that get on your last nerve before? You guys know what I'm talking about? That person that just every time, matter of fact, when you see them, you're like, oh, I got to go the other way. I'm not talking to that person today. Or you just get this like, like, you know what I mean? So that person. Remember, that's God's son or daughter. It's not just about this relationship. That's God's son or daughter. That means this relationship's off too because if you're looking at God's son and daughter like that, something's wrong right here. You got to fix. Lord, help me submit. Help change my heart. Help me see them like you do. Because that person that you get in an argument, that person you can't stand, Jesus died on the cross for them too. And so it continues. It talks about this fear in Norris, or as far as peace to you who are far away. Far away means the Gentiles, us. Before we knew God, the Gentiles had no idea about this God. And he said, we also preach this peace, this gospel to, to the people that are close. They're near. That's the Jewish people. Because they already had familiarity with, with, with the, the, the God. They already had familiarity with God. And then it says, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. It means available all. And it gives this image of this court official who escorts a visitor into the king's presence. Jesus says, here you go. Here's my Father. And now, which we didn't have access before, the wall's been torn down, the veil has been torn down, and we get to be in the holies of holies. We get to be there right in the presence of God, and we get just to have a conversation. You know what? Your conversation could just be honest. You could talk to God like, I'm just going to be real with you, God. I- I'm struggling today. I'm having a hard time with loneliness. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with some issues that happened before in my past that, that, that seem to be filtering back up. I- I'm sure my, my kids are just, they're, they're not listening God, help me, because there's some people in my life who, when I, every time I, I see them or I look at them or I hear about them, I just get this uh, inside me. God, I need your peace. Give me your peace. And what happens is God answers that and becomes that reconciler. And those walls of bitterment, those walls of hostility that is inside of us, that peace that only Jesus can give starts breaking and wearing those walls down. Husbands, if your wife ever mad at you, let me tell you something. Do what Ephesians 5.25 says. Start loving her like Christ loved the church and lay down your life for her and watch however mad she is. Eventually, it's going to kind of lower and lower and soften until she's like, you know what? I love you too. With Christ, if we keep Christ at the center, this will all work out no matter what storm comes your way. Number three, Christ is the cornerstone. Everybody say cornerstone. Cornerstone. That holds us all together. Christ is the cornerstone that holds us all together. Verse 19. So then we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. You see, in Ephesus, a stranger or they didn't have the same rights as a citizen in Ephesus. And what they're talking about is just not a members of a, a country or anything like that. They're talking about members of God's household, members of God's church. Now, as we come together, we have the same rights and heirs that Christ did. We are all brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes churches have membership. I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys probably have membership and stuff like that, too. We're Baptists, so, you know, it comes with territory. Membership, fellowship, and food. Potlucks. We like to eat. I'm hungry right now. Um, 
and, and, and with that, you know, anybody could be a guest, right? I come in here, I'm a guest. And when you're a guest, well, you welcome them. You treat them like family. Hey, how can I help? Well, you, you serve them, right? Just like somebody comes to your house, you're going to welcome them, right? You're not going to like ignore them. If, if, if somebody, a guest walks into your house where you live right now and they just walk in, you're not going to ignore them. You're not going to walk away from them. No, you'll probably offer them, hey, would you like something to drink? You hungry? Now, even so much more, a member of the own household, if it's your actually family member, you're really not going to ignore them when you see them walk in the house. You're probably going to say hello or give them a hug, right? It's automatically, it's normal, you automatically eat dinner together. Well, how does it look like when God's family in the same house, all they do is either ignore each other, they gossip about each other, they fight, they quarrel, they set divisions, say, okay, you're in that room and I'm down. You want to tell you something sad? A marriage when they're just roommates. You're in that room and I'm in that room and we're just mad at each other. That's not God's heart. That's not his heart for us. Number 20. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes you need, sometimes you need a break, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes it's sad where family members, Christians, just can't get along, ever. Verse 20. With God's house talking about, built on the foundation, God's house built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone, built on the foundation. So the apostles and the prophets were the ones that God used to write this right here. So we talk about building the foundation. What do we build our foundation on? God's word. This is what we build our foundation in our lives. We build a foundation for our marriages. We build a foundation for our family. And we build a foundation for our church. That's why I'm taking my church through this because we're just starting. And you can't, anybody ever did construction? You know what I'm talking about. You can't build a house without first building a foundation. So you want to build a, a family you want to build a business, you want to build a church, you've got to build a foundation first. And, and so by doing so, we lay down this foundation for our lives, for our families, for our church, and we put Christ as the middle piece. Christ is the center. Christ is the cornerstone. Cornerstone in that days, whenever they built like this wall, they built a building, they would put this cornerstone, and it was that one piece that held everything together. And if you take that cornerstone, if you take that piece out, everything would fall apart. You know what happens? Sometimes people, you know, they, they put Christ in their life, Christ, and they start coming to church and they start reading the Bible and they put it, they bring their families and, and things are going great. But then sometimes when things go great, we're like, okay, God, I got it now. I got off. Hey, I'm, I'm good. I got it. And they, and they kind of, they pull that cornerstone piece out. They pull Christ out of their marriage. They put Christ out of their family. They put Christ out of their life. And then all of a sudden, everything falls apart. And they wonder why. Some of the times we, they blame God. Whenever you feel like that, whenever you get disconnected, when everything's falling apart, just do one thing. Put Christ back at the center. Put Christ back in the middle of your life, of your marriage, of your church. And he'll take care of the rest. And upon that, you build the foundation off that cornerstone. In verse 21, 22, it says this. In him, the whole building, the church, being put together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are being built together for God's dwelling in the Holy Spirit. So it's two parts. One, the church, it grows. When you are being a healthy church, you are growing spiritually. And you're growing physically might not be one church kingdom, but it might be the whole kingdom. Why worship, you know, sometimes when we do outreaches, we get thousands of people to come. They might not ever set foot in my church. But you might have planted a seed. And they might have found another church somewhere. Or sometimes what we're really big on, our 10% goes to the cooperative program. So, so we plant, you know, it goes to planting churches, building uh, pastors, going to seminaries, missionaries across the world. And above and beyond that, we help support church planning. 
We help support missionaries. We sent our, our first missionaries for Hope Missions this Sunday. We prayed them out, and they're going to the Philippines, and we are a church plant. We are just getting started. We do not have the money. We are an urban church and do not have the money. But you know what? I live by faith. So I wrote a check, and I said, let's go buy some Bibles and some backpacks for the kids and go give them the gospel. God will bring it back. When we plant this church in, in Moreno Valley, we're going to be giving faithfully. We don't know how it's going to come in. Go preach the gospel and be faithful. That's where the growth happens. In our church, we want to be a church that plants churches. We want to be a church that on mission. And what that means for us, we're always going to stay a family church, so we don't want to be a mega church. But our growth is going to go this way as well as this way. Amen? So, as I close with this, can I get, sorry, if you're stage fright, I know you don't have it. Can I get you and your wife to come up here? I'm sorry for not saying this. Is that okay? Can I, can I bring you guys up here? Sorry for not saying this beforehand. Don't get mad at me. So, we'll put it like this. One on this side, one on this side. Say your names again. David. David. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Okay, so David and Elizabeth. No, this is the wall. So David and Elizabeth are two exactly different people. They look different. They think different. God had created them different. Amen? Amen. And when, when two people try to come together and be one, like a marriage, well, sometimes there's some complications that happen, Right? Because you got two exactly total people that are totally different, that think differently, that like ways done differently. And, and like me and my wife, we're as far away, east as west different. But we come together and be one. And you got to learn that, right? We got to learn, learn that with each other. So if Elizabeth, David, David, David being the spiritual leader of the household, if he's not following Christ, and he's acting in his flesh. And Elizabeth, she's not following Christ and she's acting her flesh. And all she wants to do is focus how he keeps on leaving his dirty socks all over the ground. He's not picking up, not taking out the trash. And, and he's worried about how come she's not answering me back with the text messages. It's the fifth time I've texted her. And they're focusing on all the differences or how to raise kids or the many problems that come up in a marriage. They're going to stay divided. There's going to be this wall right here. But if David picks up this Bible, which is the foundation, and first makes Christ the center of his heart and the center of his life, and he looks at his wife and he says, we need to put Jesus at the center of our marriage and the center of our family. We need to put Jesus at the center of our life, the center of our family. And she says, amen. amen. <laughs> and they do that. Now they become centered. And those divisive things aren't important because they're keeping Jesus in the middle. Because they honor the vertical. And by honoring God, he honors his wife. By honoring God, she honors her husband. And the two become one. But what happens, come back over here, when he's like, okay, things are good. I got this. And they do things on self. And all of a sudden, they get this disconnection again. How do they put it back together? they got to go back and make Jesus, put Jesus back at the heart, the center of their marriage. And by doing so, give each other a hug, the two become one. And that is a picture of not just marriage, but the church. Let us be one and not divided in every area of our life. Let's always keep Jesus at the center. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys. Give him a round of applause. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now. We thank you. We thank you so much just, just for being our God. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you for never forsaking us. God, if there's any divisions at all in our families and churches and our marriages, Father God, we ask that we just put you back at the center, that we forget about the things that separate us and we focus on the good of you. Lord, we love you. We praise you, and I just got to do this. Privacy your own hearts. I don't know everybody's walk here. I'm assuming most people are Christian, but if there is one person in this room, you don't have to get up. I'm not going to make you raise your hand. I'm not going to make you do any of that stuff, but privacy your own heart. If, if, if the most important relationship that we have is the one with God. The one that needs to be reconciled the most 
is the one with Savior. So, Father God, I just pray right now, if there's anybody in this room who has never accepted you as your personal Lord and Savior, I pray that you pull on their heart right now. And that they respond by saying this prayer with me. Lord, I'm a sinner. And I mess up. But you know that and you love me anyways. Forgive the divisions in my heart. Forgive the separation divisions I've had with you. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. And thank you for raising up on the third day so that I could have eternal life and a relationship with you. Jesus, come into my heart, heal it, and be my Lord and Savior. And for everyone else, Lord, if there's anything that for anyone that their heart has been troubled with, or maybe a group of people, Lord, I pray that you heal them right now of their heart. And remember that you died on the cross for them too. Lord, open our eyes and let us see people like you do. Open up our hearts and help us love people like you do. Put an end to division and let us be one church. And by your love, people will believe. And by your love, they will know that we are yours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, thank you guys for your time. You guys have been a blessing. And I appreciate you guys all, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sean, and thank you for bringing the God, uh, the Word of God. And um, we need to pray that we see others like God sees them. So let's take that with us. And as we are closing the, our service today, I want to make some announcements uh, for the next week. Uh, there is no coffee and prayer tomorrow, Monday and no Bible study uh, tomorrow morning. The Wednesday night um, will be live stream at 6.30. So if you have your computer, go to Hilltop um, Facebook, and you can connect to the live stream for the Wednesday night Bible study. Um, and let's build community. Like we are inviting you to join us on April 1st to have breakfast with Corey. And we are going to be at IHOP on Palm and Saturn on Imperial Beach at 9 a.m. So let's bring church together. We like to eat. So <laughs> let's go and have breakfast. Mark your calendar April 1st. At 9 a.m., I hop on Imperial Beach. And also mark on your calendar to ha we are going to have the special communion, communion, communion service on April 5th at 6.30 p.m. Prepare your hearts as we are going to have this special communion, communion service. Uh, our pastor will give you more details, but mark in your calendar. So prepare your hearts and be ready for those days. And Jerry, I'm sorry, I'm not receiving the sign. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, oh. Yes. <laughs> And Jerry, can you please close our service in prayer?